Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Larry Robinson. I'm the chief of the St. John's uh, Rehabilitation Program here at Sunnybrook, and I want to welcome you to our evening speaker series tonight. Thank you for coming tonight, and especially thank you for making it through this terrible weather. Uh, I think some people are still arriving uh, trying to get through the snow. Uh, also, welcome to those who are watching on webcast. Uh, please feel free to wave. Thank you. Uh, so, because uh, there are a number of people watching us remotely as well. So tonight our series is called All About Arthritis. This is a topic that we've actually had quite a few requests about, and so we are very pleased to have a great lineup of speakers uh, this evening. Uh, so first we'll have Dr. Shirley Lake, uh, who will talk about the different types of arthritis and the available medical treatment options. And then Dr. David Yerling will follow with a discussion on drugs uh, for pain and things for patients to consider. After that, Jean Yi, who's a physiotherapist, will talk about managing arthritis through exercise. Uh, and you're probably thinking, how can you exercise if you have arthritis? Well, you'll learn a little bit about that. And then Tiffany Chow, an occupational therapist, will tell us some helpful tips and tools for living well with arthritis. And then we'll set aside some time at the end of the evening for, for your questions. Uh, now, we've placed small blank white cards on your chairs. Does everyone have a blank white card? Yep, okay, you got it. So uh, for those of you who have the cards and have a question, please fill it up. Hold it up, and one of our staff members will come and get it. And then at the end, uh, I will take those cards and ask the uh, panel uh, questions. Uh, feel free to get up if you need to during the evening. Uh, we don't have a formal break, uh, so if you need to use the washroom or get a refreshment, those are just outside uh, in the back. So why don't we get started? We have a full uh, agenda, full lecture. Uh, at first, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Shirley Lake. Dr. Lake is a staff rheumatologist at the Holland Musculoskeletal Program, uh, and she's really an expert in uh, arthritis, and we're very fortunate to have her with us uh, this evening. So please welcome Dr. Shirley Lake to talk about different types of arthritis and available treatment options. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you everyone for coming out on such a snowy evening. Um, so my name is Shirley Lake and I'm a rheumatologist. Um, oh. uh, will my slides come up? Thanks so much. And do I just push? Yeah, okay. Can you push it? No. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Okay, so over the next um, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, we're gonna talk a little bit about what is arthritis, what are the different types of arthritis, and how can we fight that? So first off, arthritis, um, the origin of the word is Greek, meaning joint inflammation, but it's much more than just joints. It also can affect tendons, ligaments, um, soft tissues and connective tissues, and all of them can be affected, causing um, different symptoms such as pain, swelling, stiffness, and all can affect mobility. Um, arthritis is very common. Um, it's uh, the second most common reason that uh, somebody will go to see a family doctor uh, for a complaint, or, and it's the most common chronic condition that uh, Canadians have. So um, if you don't have it, somebody you know has it. So it's good that you're all here to learn more about it. Um, Arthritis is very costly, not only personally, but also economically. Uh, it's estimated over 4 million Canadians have arthritis, and every year 100,000 more Canadians will get it, so that in the next 10, um, 10 years, over 6 million Canadians will have it by 2025. So that's one in five Canadians. Um, as I already mentioned, it's the most common cause of uh, chronic illness and disability. Um, and it's costly. Uh, so it's over 33 billion Canadian dollars um, a year that was calculated back in 2010. And that's not only direct costs for medications and surgeries, but also indirect costs, such as time lost for um, away from uh, work and, and life. 
So what are the different types of arthritis? There's actually over a hundred different ones, um, but we only have 10 minutes. So I'm just gonna focus on the, the top three um, that I think that uh, people might um, have questions about. Uh, the first one is osteoarthritis, the second is rheumatoid, and the third is gout. So let's talk about osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is the most common type of arthritis, and it's what most people think of when they think of arthritis. It's an arthritis that's basically the wear and tear of joints. The cartilage gets worn down, and the body doesn't have an opportunity to repair it. It affects one in eight Canadians currently, but it gets higher the older you are, so that affects 80% of people over 80 years old. And you can see what can happen um, with the cartilage worn down um, in the x-ray there on the left-hand side where the bone pretty much is touching the other bone and that can lead to more pain and stiffness and uh, disability. Um, osteoarthritis can affect um, more th than one joint in people and it can affect weight-bearing joints such as the knees and hips, but it can also affect the hands um, and what I kind of describe as knobby knuckles, so enlargement of the bones there, but it can also affect the neck and the back. Um, so it doesn't discriminate in people. It usually happens later on in life. So what are other predisposing things to develop arthritis? So there are things that you can't change, so having birthdays and getting older. Um, unfortunately, being a female makes you more prone to osteoarthritis. Um, and then as well, it runs in families. So if your mom had it, your grandma had it, you may be prone to it as well. There are things that are modifiable though that can lead to arthritis, so things that you could potentially prevent. So having any injury, either from sports or overuse, can lead to arthritis. Um, if you have other types of arthritis that aren't treated well, sometimes it can lead to osteoarthritis. Um, obesity can lead to it, and having weak supporting muscles. So knowing that, you know, what are the treatments available? Unfortunately, um, in 2017, there is no cure for osteoarthritis, but we can help manage it, and there are treatments available. These are some of the non-medical treatments that are available. Uh, so as we mentioned before, um, uh, being, having weak supporting muscles can lead to more osteoarthritis. So, so doing things like physiotherapy and exercise and weight loss will help. And I think my colleagues will talk about this more. Um, have to, doing occupational therapy and having gadgets and home modifications might help. Other things like wearing proper shoes um, and insoles, um, such as orthotics, will help, especially if you have knee or hip arthritis. Sometimes thermal agents, such as heating pads or cooling pads, will help, and as well walking aids. So walkers and, and canes will also help in the arthritis. What are some medical treatments? Um, so again, none of these are curative, but they can help manage the pain of arthritis. Um, Tylenol has been proven to be helpful and, and is quite safe. Um, so, so that's something that you can try. Um, Anti-inflammatories, either through pills or creams, can be useful. Um, so you might have heard of Voltaire and Emigel, which is the cream, uh, versus uh, taking a pill such as naproxen or ibuprofen. Uh, other pain medications like tramadol has been helpful for people. And then when pills don't work, sometimes we can do joint injections, depending on the joint, with some corticosteroids. Um, and then when non-medical treatments and medical treatments don't work, that's when you start to think about surgery. Um, so there are different approaches depending on the joint. Um, sometimes they can do things like arthroscopy, which is going in with a scope and cleaning things up, or arthroplasties, which is replacing the joint, or something called arthrodesis, where they actually fuse the joint, and that could help, again, relieve pain and improve function. Um, and the most important thing, too, is rehabilitation. So the surgery can be one thing, but doing your rehabilitation exercises after and before is really vital. Um, other treatments that have been studied um, and don't ne and, and the studies have been kind of controversial whether they are beneficial or not include uh, glucosamine and chondroitin, um, capsaicin topical creams, as well as intraarticular hyaluronic acids such as Simvisc or Duralay. 
Um, there are a lot of other commercially um, advertised products that you might have seen commercials for, and um, a lot of them are not proven um, with evidence, scientific evidence, that they are beneficial. So just be aware of the risks and talk to your doctors about it. Next arthritis I want to talk about is rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis is the most common autoimmune associated arthritis. So that's when the immune system um, attacks the, gets confused and starts to attack the joints. Um, it occurs in one in a hundred people, more common in females, and more common between the ages of 30 and 60 years old. But it can even occur younger and older. Um, it's a very aggressive arthritis, and if you don't treat it, it can actually cause disability 50% within 10 years. <clears throat> the symptoms are slightly different than the osteoarthritis. So where in osteoarthritis, the predominant symptom is pain, usually for rheumatoid arthritis, the first thing they'll notice is that there's swelling, and that leads to pain um, in itself. Also, the joints that are affected are quite different. So they usually affect the hand joints um, and the small joints and the feet. Um, stiffness is very common. They have more than an, an hour of morning stiffness, um, and that's associated, um, uh, the younger you are, you can have more morning stiffness. And, and different than osteoarthritis, where pain is worse the more you move, rheumatoid arthritis actually gets better with movement. So inactivity actually can make it worse. Um, it can also be associated with other symptoms in the body. So um, such as shortness of breath, um, carpal tunnel, and other things. So there's other things that we look for. So how do we make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis? So besides taking a good history and doing a physical exam, there are blood uh, work factors that we can look for to make the diagnosis. Um, these include something called rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP, or cyclic citrullinated protein in the blood. Um, also, we usually get x-rays in the hands and the feet, and this looks different than osteoarthritis, where in rheumatoid you can see erosions and complete joint space loss. The treatment of rheumatoid arthritis is, um, it is not curative either, but a lot of treatment is effective to, turn, to basically suppress the immune system to turn, turn off the disease. Um, the mainstay of treatment is something called disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, or DMARDs for short, and the most common one is methotrexate. You may have also heard about other disease-modifying drugs, such as biologic therapies. Also, all patients with rheumatoid arthritis should think about um, seeing a physiotherapist as well for exercise and, and lifestyle modifications. And when they have pain, NSAIDs and steroids can be quite beneficial. The last type of, of arthritis I wanted to touch on this, this evening is gout. So gout is an arthritis um, that's because of too much uric acid in the blood. And this uric acid needs to go someplace and usually goes into cold joints such as the feet. Usually presents with a red, hot, swollen joint um, and can be so painful you can't even put a sheet over it. It usually occurs in people who are, are similar to what you see in that picture on the top left-hand corner. So it's more common in males, um, usually at a younger age, 20 to 40 is when it usually comes up. Um, people uh, who can be overweight, drink a lot of alcohol, eat a lot of good food, um, and aren't very active. The treatment of gout, is twofold. One is treating the acute flares that can happen, but also preventing the attacks. And with gout, there's also very good treatment that can do that. So when you have a flare, the treatment is usually rice or rest, ice, and elevate. The use of anti-inflammatories, um, either by pill or as a cream. Colchicine has also been effective, as well as taking steroids. And you can either do this by a pill or injection. There are also treatments to prevent gout attacks, thus by lowering the uric acid. Uh, number one definitely is uh, dietary changes, so trying to cut down red meat, uh, alcohol, sugary drinks. 
um, and as well other medications such as allopurinol and fluvoxystat. The best thing too is maintaining general overall health, so weight loss, blood pressure control, and cholesterol also, uh, managing your cholesterol also helps gout. So hopefully I've been able to convince you that arthritis is very common and that there are many different types, more than we could talk about today. Um, but there are ways that we can treat it. And if you follow a proven effective treatment plan, you should get some benefit. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lake. That was great. Uh, we learned a lot about some of the basic types of arthritis, so I appreciate that. Uh, now, as you mentioned, uh, pain is often the presenting complaint or one of the main complaints of patients with arthritis, and treatment of pain is not necessarily all that straightforward. So we're really pleased to have our next speaker, Dr. David Urlink. He's the director of the Division of Clinical Pharmacology and Toxicology, and here, here he's gonna talk about pain control with medications. So we're just going to have your hand. Get your slides ready. There you go. Thanks, Mike. By the way, I was operating this. You could tell this is why I'm not a surgeon. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak, and uh, nice to see you all out. So I'm going to, for 15 minutes or so, talk about medications for pain. And there are literally 20 different drugs that we might use in different patients, depending on the circumstance. I'm gonna focus on a, a small number of drugs that are either commonly used or ones that are controversial. And I want to make a point, and the point is this. Uh, when I see a patient in the emergency department or in the hospital, or when you perhaps go to your doctor or go to the pharmacist or a medicine cabinet, we often, or when I've done the same thing myself, we often think about the objective of taking a pill or an injection or using a patch as reducing the pain or making the pain less. And that's part of it, but I think we need to understand that the goal of treating pain with medication isn't simply pain relief. And if you accept the fact that all drugs have potential benefits in a given patient, and all drugs have potential harms in a given patient, what we're really trying to do when we give a patient a medicine, or when you might take one, is to afford the patient more benefit than harm. And of course, pain relief is subsumed under benefit, as is improved function and improved quality of life. Um, but I think the point to make here is that when you take a pill, or when your doctor prescribes you a medicine, or when I prescribe one of my patients, what we're really doing is experimenting on the individual, trying to strike that balance between benefits and harm. And so with that, I want to talk first about acetaminophen. Every one of you, I'm going to guess, has this in your medicine cabinet. Some of you took it today. Uh, probably the most widely used analgesic on the planet. And it goes by a variety of names, Tylenol kind of being the, the main one. This drug was made, by the way, in the 1800s. It's been around for a long time, but it's been used for decades. Um, how does it work? Well, I used to think I knew how it worked. The answer is we don't actually really know exactly what it does. It's, it, it probably inhibits the formation of something called prostaglandins. I'll come to that in a little bit. In the brain and the spinal cord. That's probably how it reduces fever. It's pretty good at that. Uh, and it likely is how it reduces pain. But I think in the context of long-term acetaminophen use, I think we want, this is a, I don't intend you to read the whole study, but this is a nice review of the available evidence. Keep in mind, this drug was brought to market decades ago. And it wasn't studied in the same way that drugs are studied in 2018. Um, and the bottom line is that it doesn't really work very well for most patients. I don't mean to suggest that it can't work in some people, but when you look at a, a hundred people who are taking three or four grams of Tylenol a day, on balance it doesn't do very much to pain scores. Um, I think within that hundred people, there are one or two or three who are deriving meaningful benefit from it, benefit that exceeds the potential harms, but it's not as great an analgesic as we used to think it was. The main side effect of acetaminophen is that it can harm your liver. And I've said before that I think if, if I was a drug company and I invented acetaminophen in 2018 and I brought it to the FDA or to Health Canada and I tried to get it approved, it probably wouldn't be allowed to market. It wouldn't be allowed to be marketed because the, the doses of acetaminophen you need 
to hurt your liver aren't that much higher than the doses that we prescribe to people chronically for chronic pain. So this is why it's generally a bad idea to go above four grams a day. The extra strength Tylenol is about 500 milligrams, so eight of those a day is 4,000 milligrams. We, some people advocate not going above 3,000. Um, in people who drink alcohol, it's not wrong to combine alcohol and acetaminophen, but in people who drink regularly, drink more two or three drinks a day, the effect of Tylenol or acetaminophen on the liver is enhanced. And so there, we, we know that in some people, they are more prone to the liver injury that Tylenol can cause, and alcohol is a major predictor of that. I think one point I want to make is that um, I'm a toxicologist as well as an internist, and so we see a lot of people with, with Tylenol-related liver injury. And there are two kinds of people like that, people who take a bottle in an attempt to harm themselves, uh, but we often see people who are just simply taking more than they intended. They might be on three or four grams a day as part of their osteoarthritis regimen, and then they develop a cold or a flu, and they go to the drugstore, and they take things that they don't realize contain acetaminophen. It's very easy to get up to six grams a day. And if you happen to be sick, and maybe you haven't eaten very well for the past few days, it's not at all uh, difficult to envision that you can get into trouble from a, a liver perspective. So that's important to be aware of if you're on three or four grams of Tylenol a day. The other less important point, uh, if this is not widely appreciated, even by many doctors, I have to say, but if, if you are taking a blood thinner called warfarin, which is something we use a lot to prevent strokes in people with atrial fibrillation and then to prevent or treat blood clots, uh, in some people who take even a few grams of Tylenol a day, just um, on a single occasion, uh, this can really exaggerate the response to warfarin. It's not something, again, that's widely appreciated. It's, it's, we know why this happens, um, but I'm convinced that it's... Uh, the sort of thing that goes unrecognized quite a lot. Now on to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Anti-inflammatory drugs are NSAIDs for short. Okay, so these um, aspirin, again from the 1800s, uh, Motrin and Aleve. These are the three that in Canada you can buy without uh, prescription. So Motrin being ibuprofen, Aleve being the proxy. But there are about 20 or so uh, drugs in this class, um, and they. Um, work differently than acetaminophen does. They actually directly inhibit the synthesis of these noxious things called prostaglandins. Now I want you to imagine, here's your brain sensing pain, and here is the source of your pain. Maybe it's some inflammation from a, a, a gouty toe, like you were showing a moment ago. Maybe it's from cancer-related pain. Maybe it's from an injury, okay? The things that happen at the site of inflammation or injury that result in the transmission of pain signals to the brain are numerous, but one of those things is the production of these noxious compounds called prostaglandins. And drugs like ibuprofen and naproxen and so on inhibit the production of those compounds. And this is how they reduce pain, and this is how they uh, reduce fever as well. Um, so, as I just said, this is how they work. But the point I want to make about these drugs is most of their side effects pertain to the fact that not all prostaglandins are bad. All of you right now have throughout your bodies, you've got prostaglandins doing good things, keeping your kidneys functioning properly, keeping the lining of your stomach intact. Okay, so many of the consequences, the harms that accompany NSAID therapy, especially with long-term treatment, uh, reflect the disruption of an otherwise good process. And so in the stomach, stomach irritation or gastritis, um, ulcers, um, and an increased risk of bleeding. This is not likely to happen after a single dose of 400 milligrams of ibuprofen, but it, with long-standing regular use, it's actually pretty common. In some people, these drugs can interfere with kidney function. They can actually make your kidneys shut down, uh, and they can cause you to retain water, and they can build up in your legs and build up in your lungs. Um, sometimes that manifests as heart failure, and very rarely in some people who are predisposed, these drugs can actually be a, a contributor to the development of heart disease and heart attack. Here's a picture uh, of a lining of the stomach. This is a, from an endoscopy procedure, and what the stomach lining should look like is nice and pink and reddish, and you can see these black areas. Okay? These are the result of chronic NSAID gastropathy is the $10 word. This is the, this is the effect of chronic use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs on the stomach. And every doctor who has practiced for any length of time has seen and been burned by patients that we've tried to help and we've actually harmed more than helped through exactly this mechanism. Um, you can't have a talk about pain medicine without talking about opioids a little bit, okay? So drugs like 
codeine, oxycodone, hydromorphone, and others. Um, uh, you, you have to have been living under a rock for the past 10 years to not be aware of what's come to be called the opioid crisis. And I think I want to make a point that the, and you can tell from these headlines, that the crisis that you hear about every day in the papers and uh, on radio, uh, it's not really one thing. I mean, part of this crisis is about people with addictions uh, who are dying in large numbers because of an incredibly toxic drug supply and because they aren't getting the sort of help that people with addictions need. That's one camp of patients. Uh, but there is also an element to this crisis that involves pain and its management. Uh, and it's in particular, it's mismanagement in some people with opioids. This is a very controversial area. It generates a lot of heat, a lot of disagreement amongst well-meaning doctors. Opioids can generally be characterized as weak or strong uh, based upon how much it takes to affect a given amount of pain relief. Uh, codeine, many of you are familiar with, in Canada you can still buy small amounts of codeine without a prescription at your local pharmacy. Uh, and tramadol is another drug. Uh, there's a variety of other strong opioids that exist. These would be the most commonly used ones, at least in Canada, and there are some of the example brand names. So most but not all of these drugs originate from the opium poppy, as heroin did. Okay, so oxy, if I showed you a chemical structure of oxycodone or codeine and morphine and I put it next to heroin, it would look pretty much indistinguishable from a chemical perspective. And in fact, they do the same things more or less when it comes to their beneficial and their harmful effects. How do they work? So they bind to these receptors in your body, in your ner nervous system called opioid receptors. If you can imagine that the transmission of pain from a, a sore joint to your brain involves a variety of pathways, there's the signal right there, um, opioids will come in to these receptors, mimicking normal compounds that live in all of us, uh, uh, and block the transmission of pain. So they actually are, these are miracle drugs in some people. I mean, they really do work well, especially initially. Um, this is a study, a part of a, a study published in the mid-1990s. And I, I want to sort of walk you through this. And take, imagine you take a group of around 50 people with chronic pain and you give some of them morphine and you give some of them placebo, sugar pills, and you measure a variety of things, but one of the things you measure is pain relief. How much pain relief did you get? And the higher you are here, this is over time, the higher you are, the more pain relief you got. Okay, so I want you to notice that compared to sugar pills, morphine actually affects, not surprisingly, some pain relief, a non-trivial amount of pain relief in people with chronic pain. But look what happens over the months and months in the trial. At the end of this trial, People who are on an average of around 80 milligrams of morphine don't really have any appreciable difference in the amount of pain they feel compared to people who are on sugar pills. And so this phenomenon is something that doesn't get talked about enough. It's called tolerance and what doctors were taught to do. I was taught this myself, and in fact I may have even taught it to others in the early 2000s, was to, when you when confronted with this loss of effect of physical opioids, is just to increase the dose. There's no ceiling effect. Right? Maybe you run 20 milligrams of morphine a day initially, Well, over time if the pain relief attenuates and wanes, you can go to 40 or you can go to 60. And um, I've personally had patients on thousands of milligrams of morphine a day because that's what we thought 15 years ago was the right thing to do when the pain relief from opioids wore off. So the crisis that you read about um, isn't just about people dying. This, this is US data and it's been dated, but I want to make the point here that the prescribing of opioids has literally gone through the roof. I was a pharmacist from 1990 to 1995. And when someone came to the pharmacy with a prescription for morphine, it was almost always the case that they had cancer. Um, it, it wasn't common at all to put people on opioids long term for back pain or, or hip pain or, or what have you. Uh, but we gradually got the message doctors did that opioids could be used safely and effectively in the long term. And I don't mean to suggest that they can't. I prescribe them myself for chronic pain with some regularity, but the way we prescribed them 10 or 15 years ago has caused an awful lot of harm. Um, what are some of the harms? Well, constipation is a, I mean, it sounds like an annoyance. Everyone's had it from time to time, but, but uh, in some people on opioids, constipation can be serious, and I've even had a couple of people die under my care from the consequences of opioid-induced constipation with perforated bowels. Um, so it wouldn't be unusual uh, to have someone come to the hospital who's confused and the opioid perhaps playing a role in their confusion. 
they are well established as a potential cause of falls and fractures and head injuries. And we don't necessarily think to blame them when someone who's 70 or 80 and is on opioids has a fall because people in their 70s and 80s sometimes fall. We, every night on call, we admit someone who's had a fall. But drugs, sleeping pills, pain meds, and others play a role sometimes. They can cause trouble from a sleeping perspective and breathing perspective. And at high doses, they can suppress testosterone in men. Um, they are a well established risk factor for car accidents. Um, and in some people, not, I don't think many, but in some people, they can actually make pain worse. Um, this is phenomenon is called opioid induced hyperalgesia. It's uh, something that uh, yeah, is not well studied, but we, I think most doctors who manage pain with any regularity have seen exactly this. And no one thinks, uh, no one doubts that depression, which is very common, no one doubts that depression can be a consequence of chronic pain, of course it can. Uh, but there's a very large and growing body of evidence to suggest that in some people, opioids themselves might be a contributor to the development of depression. And when you take those people and you slowly, slowly cut back their opioid doses, it's surprising how often their depression improves. And sometimes even their function improves. And sometimes even their pain improves. Um, but perhaps, I think this is perhaps the most malignant side effect of opioids, is this phenomenon of physical dependence. And I don't think this gets talked about enough. The, the concept is this. If you start an opioid and you take it regularly for even a couple of days, in some people, it becomes hard to stop. I've, I've looked after uh, people who after just three days of, uh, physicians actually, just after three days of opioids, stop the drug and they realize they've got pain and they've got diarrhea and abdominal cramping and they feel horrible and they can't sleep. These are all characteristic features of opioid withdrawal. And you can imagine how somebody who's under the care of a well-intentioned doctor who's put on opioids and has escalated to high doses over many years, would come to perceive that the drugs are needed and helpful because without them, they get sick. And that is not always, but sometimes, uh, I think, part of the harm that befalls patients who are on chronic opioid therapy and leads them to continue to take drugs that uh, a case can be made are causing more harm than benefit. This is a piece I wrote, and if any of you want it, I'm pretty easy to find in the email on the internet, I'm happy to email you a copy of this piece, but unpacking the whole concept of what it really means to be doing well on chronic opioid therapy. So uh, just to make this point, benefits versus harms, we talked about this, but as the doses go up, all of these harms I talked about are dose related, and it's very easy to be in a situation where the harms are exceeding the benefit, and the benefit in some people, I'm comfortable in this assertion, even though it's not welcome in some circles, the benefit of high dose opioids, in particular in some people, the primary benefit is the avoidance of withdrawal, not the pain relief that the doctor started you on the medicine in the first place for. Now you can't talk about medicines for pain without talking about marijuana, cannabis, okay? Because it's gonna be legal in July. Uh, patients who ask me, I've prescribed it myself a couple of times for patients with acute and chronic pain. Um, is a cheeky title of a piece I wrote a few years ago when the rules around cannabis changed in Canada and Health Canada was taken out of the mix and it really became a decision between a doctor and his or her patient. Um, most of you are familiar with the potential for people to smoke cannabis and joints and bongs, but increasingly people are vaporizing it. They're heating it up. It's not, it doesn't turn to ash. It doesn't combust, but, they, but the potentially beneficial compounds in cannabis are, are volatilized and you inhale them. Uh, but, in, but I think most docs who prescribe cannabis or cannabis products prefer to use an oral formulation, an oil or a capsule of some sort or another. Now, a lot of docs will say, and my own family doctor actually says that he, not that I approached him about this, but he says uh, at our initial meeting, I don't prescribe this and this and this, and I don't prescribe cannabis. And that's okay with me. But most of the opposition around cannabis comes in three forms. First is it involves smoking, and you're taught from an early age, years before medical school, that smoking is bad, and I think a lot of docs who prescribe cannabis uh, discourage the use of smoked cannabis. The other bit of evidence, is a bit of argument, is that there's no good studies, and this is totally true. It's amazing how little data we have out there to support the use of cannabinoids. Um, mostly because there's no big drug company with billions of dollars pouring into the, uh, the, the, the research side of things. But there are also some potential harms, okay? And so these things are all true. There are no good studies, and there are lots of potential harms to cannabis. But my, the reason I am uh, somewhat more uh, favorable, or I view cannabis somewhat more favorably than perhaps I did five years ago, is that when you think about, especially the management of chronic pain, 
You think of the, you think of the balance of benefits and harms and all the ways in which drugs like anti-inflammatories and opiates can cause harm, sometimes harm that exceeds the benefit. It's not that cannabis doesn't have some potential harms, it does, but they don't hold a candle to the harms of the other drugs that we prescribe for pain long term. So um, I think, you know, this is why I'm, if you're going to experiment and you're trying to achieve a balance of benefits and excessive harms, it makes sense to, I think, use something uh, that has a, a lower risk of harm. So if an 80-year-old person says to me, I've got horrible back pain and I can't take anti-inflammatories and I don't want to take opioids or they make me sleepy or growl, you have no problem with the concept of experimenting on that individual patient, trying to find out whether or not uh, a low dose of a cannabinoid product can actually help them feel better and function better. So that's the end of my chat. I just wanted to sort of give you a sense of the limited number of drugs we have at our disposal and their benefits and the baggage that come with them. I'm not sure if that's what you wanted, but that's what you got. Thanks very much for your attention. That was great. They, thank you very much, David. That was a great talk. And as you can see, the amount of uh, medications that we have uh, that have uh, benefits that outweigh risk, they're kind of limited. So you have to think carefully about what medications to take uh, and also think about your function, not just the immediate pain relief, but what does that do to function. So you're thinking about, well, if the drugs aren't there to create a cure, what other options do we have? Well, what about exercise? And you saw some of the pictures from Dr. Lake earlier, and you saw those worn out joints, you're thinking, how can I exercise if I have arthritis? Well, we do have an expert, Jean Lee, right behind me. Uh, she's gonna be talking about using exercise for arthritis. Uh, Jean is a physiotherapist. Uh, she works with patients uh, with arthritis, and uh, she knows quite a bit about this, so. Welcome, Jean. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, it's a pleasure for me today to come and share some information on how to manage arthritis uh, with exercise. Um, so the uh, objective today of my talk is right now is understand how and why exercise and physical activities are an important part of managing arthritis. And the second one is discuss and recommend types of exercise that benefit individuals diagnosed with arthritis. So people with arthritis, some of you do have, uh, can present with symptoms such as intermittent pain and swelling, stiffness, sometimes muscle weakness, intermittent limping, even redness and warmth around the joint, and mild loss of joint movement. So what do you do about it? Now we've already, uh, the rheumatologist Shirley already said, there is actually no cure. Even though there is no cure to the uh, arthritis, through exercise we can actually improve the symptoms and also we can improve the physical and functional challenges. All right, so once you found out that you may have arthritis, it's important to start taking steps to prevent possible progression of these symptoms. So today the talk I'm going to be giving is based on the treatment, but the first line of treatment. I'm going to be talking about education, exercise, and weight control. So, now that you have, you, you know, the symptoms and you experience the symptoms of arthritis and you may have arthritis, what do you do? It is crucial for people who are in this position to understand what arthritis means. And that's why you're here today. And it's great to see so many of you here with the weather that is not so great. And uh, to, once you recognize the signs and symptoms of these arthritis, then you can come and start developing, thinking about developing self-management strategies. So, um, a lot of people feel that more activities means more pain. So, um, people who are experiencing pain with arthritis, they may think, well, I don't wanna do these activities because they're causing more pain, and if I have more pain, it means I'm doing more damage to my joint. So I don't want to do anything. I really want to just rest. The problem is when you avoid the movement, avoid physical activity, what's going to happen is you may end up having a stiff joint, you may end up having weakness in your muscles, and sometimes even weight gain. So what you think is actually doing yourself a favor, you're actually not doing yourself any favor by maybe causing even more harm for not moving. So why do you exercise? 
Exercise is actually a very important part of uh, management of arthritis, regardless of your age, regardless of your, your uh, limitation in function, regardless of your intensity of pain. Uh, exercise is actually very important. Historically, um, a lot of the medical professionals may say, well, um, don't do exercise, you should rest. In fact, even now, a lot of the medical professionals may be hesitant to prescribe exercise. But in fact, um, a lot of the latest research, evidence-based research has shown that exercise actually does help decrease pain, increase joint mobility, strength, and physical function, and help you maintain healthy weight. So this is something that, um, that's more new for a lot of people, a lot of professionals, and it's something that's to be aware of. So what are our goals of, our, our goals of doing exercises? The goal is actually reduce symptoms of arthritis, is to increase physical function and activities of daily living or general activities, and to improve your quality of life. And lastly, the goal of exercise is to reduce, hopefully, pain medications and um, the side effects of the long-term use, which was already discussed before. So the first thing we talked about is um, exercise. I mean, the second thing we talked about exercise. Um, I'm going to be describing different types of exercises, actually. The first one is range of motion and gentle stretching exercises. So each of our joints in our body move in different directions. So range of motion really um, is telling you how far these joints can move in those directions. Now, the goal when you want to do range of motion exercise, the goal is to maximize those movements of the joints. And uh, a lot of the people, when they experience in pain in the joints, they don't want to move the joint. They like to keep their joints in the position that's most comfortable. So um, uh, sort of um, comfortable position where you don't have to move the joint. And what happens is when you keep those joints in those comfortable positions and you avoid moving them, um, the joints can get stiff, you can, the joints can get contracted, muscle get tight, and you end up having limited movement, which will limit your function, which is not doing you any good. So when you're doing range of motion and stretching exercise, what it does is it maintain increased joint motion, it prevents contracture of soft tissue around the joints, and it increases the extensibility of muscle around the joint. I just want to give you some example of range of motion exercise. Now, the picture on the left is somebody who's doing a um, range of motion exercise for the knee. Very simply done, he's lying on his back. He starts off with the knee straight, and he brings his heel and slides his heel towards his buttock as far as he can and he goes back to the straightening position again. That's active knee flexion. That's range of motion for the knee. Now the second picture we're talking about is just some gentle stretching exercise for somebody who has a, let's say, uh, a stiffness in the wrist. All you do is bring your arm out and then point your fingers towards a 12 o'clock position and use the other hand to gently pull until you feel a little bit of a stretch and you hold it for 20 to 30 seconds. This is just an example of a stretching exercise. Another type of exercise I want to talk about is strengthening exercise. Now, research have found that individuals with arthritis often have weaknesses around the joint. And what happens when you have weakness around the joints is you end up having decreased ability in that joint, and then you will end up with decreased physical function. Now, uh, the uh, strengthening exercise can help maintain and improve muscle strength and also help support and protect joints. Now, um, with strengthening exercise, it can be categorized into isometric and isotonic exercise, as well as weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing exercise. Isometric exercise are exercises where you do resistant movement and strengthening uh, movement without the movement of joint. For example, if you have a joint that's really sore, and you don't want to move it, but you really want to strengthen the muscle around the joint. You can do the exercise without moving the joint, and the muscle are still contracting, you're still strengthening it, but without the pain of movement of joint. I'll give you an example of that after. Isotonic exercise are movement through the range with weights or resistive band. You can use that to strengthen your muscle as well. And then there's a weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing exercises. Weight-bearing exercises are exercises that you are actually putting weight through your leg and your foot on a stable surface. And non-weight-bearing exercises are quite often done in a sitting or lying down position, so there's no load on the joint. 
Example, I talked about isometric and isotonic exercise. Isometric exercise, here's a person who wants to strengthen his biceps. He doesn't want to move the elbow because the elbow is sore. So what happened is he can resist uh, himself with the other hand, and there is that contraction of the bicep, but there is no movement. He can still strengthen the muscle without moving the joint. The second exercise, the isotonic exercise, where the person is doing a strengthening exercise through the whole range of motion of the elbow. Now he is strengthening the biceps, but he's using a band to give a resistance. And as I mentioned before, there is a non-weight bearing uh, exercise and the weight bearing exercise. Here's a picture of two people who are trying to strengthen their quadriceps muscle. And here's a lady who was doing uh, strengthening of the quadriceps, but she's doing a sitting down position. In this position, there's no load on her joint, and she's able to strengthen the muscle without loading. Again, as I said before, that for people who don't want to uh, put weight through their knee or hip or uh, uh, the foot because it's too painful, you can isolate the muscle by doing in a non-weight bearing position, okay? Here's an example of a person doing weight bearing position. Um, and strengthen his quads. Now, because he needs to control his body over his feet, not only is he, and he end up exercising his quads, he's actually using multiple muscles uh, in order to keep himself in this position to strengthen his quads. He has end up using all these other muscles around him too. Um, weight bearing exercise is actually very good in the sense that because a lot of the stuff we do um, in our daily activities are actually in, in weight bearing positions. For example, going on the stairs, uh, when you're walking, when you're squatting, when you're doing housework, those are all in functional position and they're in weight-bearing position. So uh, exercising in weight-bearing position can be very helpful for you. And also exercising in weight-bearing position also help with your positional sense of your joints. And that would also help in terms of your balance as well. Um, another exercise I want to talk about is aerobic exercise. And this is low impact aerobic exercise. When we say aerobic exercise, we're pretty much saying it's almost like, uh, it's, it's exercise that gets your uh, respiratory rate up. It gets your heart pumping. And those, uh, for low impact aerobic exercise, it's great because not only you're getting your heart pumping, but you're also, um, uh, also doing range of motion exercises and strengthening exercise without the heavy load on your joints. So exercise such as walking, biking, swimming, aquatic exercise, they don't put a lot of load on your joints, but they allow your heart to pump and allow you to do uh, mobility and strengthening. Now, um, aerobic exercises are known to improve pain symptoms, improve physical function, and also help with weight control. Now, some research have also shown that there's positive effect on psychological states such as depression, which can come with arthritis as well. I want to mention something about aquatic exercise and hydrotherapy. Um, they are known also, research has shown that these exercises help improve pain, strength, and function. Now, um, when you're in the water, the buoyancy of the water reduces the, the loading on the joint. I'm sure some of you like going to aquatic exercise, going to hydrotherapy, and you find that it's easier to do exercise in water because less load on the joint. And the water pressure and the temperature, especially in the hydrotherapy pool, the water is warm. And with that, it will decrease your pain and makes the exercise a lot easier when you're in water. And the water also provides resistance and that will help increase the strength as well. Hydrotherapy and um, aquatic exercise are actually especially beneficial for people who are more overweight or who have severe joint pain because it takes a lot of load off your joint when you're exercising. Last exercise I want to talk about is balance exercise. Uh, as I mentioned before, people with arthritis can have weakness in the muscles around the joint, and that can sometimes help cause problems in terms of decreasing your balance, and there's always that risk of falls. So I just include a picture of something very simple. It's called a tandem stance, and that's an exercise you can do to help with your balance. So you can put one foot in front of the other, and it actually narrows your base of support. And by standing in that position for a period of time, or as long as you can, it actually helps with your balance and your coordination, okay? 
So I've described all these exercises, and it sounds wonderful, but some of you are going to be wondering, well, how am I going to start these exercises? Where do I go? What do I do? Before you start the exercise, it's best to talk to your doctor uh, or your, your rheumatologist specialist or physiotherapist to find out what type of exercise would be best suited for you, considering your medical condition or severity of your symptoms or the type of arthritis you have, what will actually work best for you. Now, once you've done that, then there's actually three groups of where you, should, you can do. The first one is individual treatment, which is one-on-one -on -one instruction. So, for example, if you go to a physiotherapist, they can assess you, they can guide you through the exercises, and they can correct your exercise and make sure you're doing it properly, and they will progress you accordingly. That's the one-on-one. -on -one. And the second group of exercise, second type of, uh, of uh, choice is the group exercise class. Now, some people prefer to go to group exercise class because there's also that social component. When you go to exercise class and you're being taught by a professional and you're doing exercise with people who have the same condition, experience the same symptoms you have, sometimes it's good for that peer support. So group exercise can be preferred by some people. Now, example of group exercise class is at St. John's, we do have an athletic pool program where people go in and do exercise in the water, um, with the uh, trained um, individual, and they find this very helpful. And then there was another program called the GLAD Canada, where people are trained uh, to give appropriate exercises uh, uh, to individuals with arthritis. Now, the third type of exercise program is home based exercise program. Now, these are just programs you can do at home on your own. The only drawback is that you don't have anybody showing you how to do it properly, and there is a risk of, of hurting yourself if you don't do it properly. Okay. So what um, a lot of people do is a combination of the three type of exercise. They, um, they, get, they go to therapies first, and then they teach them how to do it properly and do the exercise at home afterwards. So it really depends on what works best for you, what's most cost effective, what's most convenient, and what you think will help you stay on the program. That's most important. So how much is too much? Now some people may think, um, you know, I'm getting some pain now, I don't want to do anymore, and you know, is pain normal? Often you may have a little soreness in the muscles or a little soreness, a discomfort in the joint when you do exercise. Maybe you're not used to doing exercise. And it doesn't mean that the damage has been done. But just be aware that if you are getting a lot of pain, or a lot of discomfort, such as the one I've listed here, it's probably a good idea to pull back on the exercise, to modify or lessen the exercise. Things like severe intense pain during exercises, pain doesn't subside to usual level for several hours, increased night pain or pain the following day, or swelling or increased swelling after exercise and the next day. If you get those symptoms, you should watch out, maybe you should pull back on your exercise. So the last part I want to talk about a little bit is about weight control. Now, Statistics Canada in 2014 states that 20.2 percent of Canadian age 18 and up have been classified as obese, and more alarmingly, 40 percent of men and 27.5 percent of women are considered overweight. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the fact that obesity is linked with a lot of these chronic diseases: high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes cardiovascular disease, osteoarthritis, and certain types of cancer. In addition to that, imagine the amount of weight that's played out on the joint when you're overweight. When you're overweight, it increased stress and load on the joint, especially the hips and the knees. Now, research has shown that each pound of weight loss will result in a four-pound reduction of load exerted on the knee per step. So imagine how much load and weight is placed on your joint when you're doing your daily activities. Now, if you are overweight, just think, if you reduce a few pounds, what a huge difference they can make on your joint. So it is important to maintain a healthy weight with exercise and physical function. Now, the thing is, you know, it's all good about, to talk about, you know, let's exercise, let's start exercising. And I think at the beginning, people get excited and they're happy about doing exercises, but after a while, you kind of get bored and you want to stop doing exercises. How do I maintain? how do I adhere to the exercise program? You just have to keep remembering that the benefit of the exercise is to improve your symptoms and really improve your quality of life. And usually what I tell my patient is, really do what you enjoy doing. 
if you enjoy doing the exercise and follow the routine that fits you the best, it will become part of your lifestyle and you'll enjoy doing it. And that will be a good way to manage your arthritis. Thank you. Gene, thank you. That gives us uh, another thing we can use in our repertoire to treat arthritis. It's not all about medications, but you have other exercise choices. Now, some of you may have questions. Anyone have any questions? Hold up your card. Okay, and we have staff in the back, and they're going to come and collect your cards. So hold them up, and we will collect the cards, and we will have the panel at the end to discuss, uh, to, to discuss the questions that you have. So our next speaker is Tiffany Chow. Tiffany is an occupational therapist with the St. John's Rehabilitation Program, and she's going to talk about some additional tips and tools for healthy living with arthritis. Oh, there you are. Okay, but I might need you here. Yeah. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Robinson. So I'm Tiffany and I'm an occupational therapist. And as an occupational therapist, I help patients to engage or re-engage in daily activities that, that has meaning to them or purpose to them. I'll be speaking about two concepts that you can use to self-manage your arthritis. I have a lot of patients with arthritis that tell me that because of pain and stiffness, they have become more dependent on their family members to do things for them, or perhaps they stop the tasks altogether. With learning about these strategies, it is meant to empower you, give you different ideas and solutions to resume the activities that give you purpose. You will find that these strategies are practical and maybe some of them you've already adopted into your lifestyle. I'll be going through the why, when, and what of joint protection and energy conservation. Why use joint protection? Think about these strategies as a way of offloading the pressure on your joints or enabling you to do things differently without putting strain on your joint. And so these strategies are meant to decrease pain, decrease joint deformity, and decrease joint damage, as well to decrease the wear and tear on joint surfaces. When should you use these techniques? I would say if you've been diagnosed with arthritis or beginning to feel a dull, achy pain in the mornings, that's a good indicator to start using these strategies. As well, if you start feeling that your joint is becoming stiff or you have stiffness. Or perhaps you've been told from a therapist or a physician that you have an unstable joint or that the ligament surrounding your joint has become overstretched or laxed. The idea is to use drug protection strategies in your day-to-day -day life while you're doing things. So what is it? One idea is to respect pain. The most important thing is refrain from doing movements that give you excessive pain. If an activity gives you pain for maybe more than an hour afterwards, that can indicate the, that the activity was too stressful on your joints. Use pain as a sign that that movement or activity needs to be done differently. As well, avoid repetitive movements. For example, when doing housekeeping tasks like wiping the table or cleaning the mirror, that can re require repetitive movement of your shoulder. Instead, try switching arms. Give your affected arm a break. Avoid being in static hold positions. Uh, meaning holding a position for a long period of time. You should change positions often. For example, don't sit for too long. Get up and walk every commercial break when watching television. Get yourself moving. Use good body mechanics. Good body mechanics means preventing injury by using proper body positioning when you're in movement. This allows you to save energy, protect your bones and muscles from strain, as well, it gives you better balance during activity. There are a couple of key ideas to having proper body mechanics. 
Firstly, you want to stand with your legs apart to create a stronger foundation or create a larger base of support. As well, you want to bend at the knees instead of at your waist. So this will protect your back, your shoulder, as well as your neck from injury. Use your body weight to push your pull. Make sure that you have one leg in front of another and you should shift your weight while you are pushing or pulling. When carrying heavy items, have them close to your body or near waist level. This is the least strenuous way to carry a heavy load as your whole body is engaged while you're in this position. Ensure you are sitting with hips and knees at at least 90 degrees. It means making sure your chair height is high enough so that it is easier for you to get off of. Uh, as well, this position allows for a better sitting posture when you are sitting. When working at tables or countertops, make, the, make sure that the height is appropriate for you so that you're comfortable and you're not bending at your back or craning your neck, perhaps elevating your shoulders to compensate for the uh, height, of, height difference. Use the stronger and larger joint to work and distribute load to more than one joint. For example, use a crossbody bag or messenger bag to distribute the weight of the bag to your body or shoulder, which is the larger joint, instead of carrying the bags with your hands. You can use equipment or adaptive aids. They help you perform certain movements easier, uh, but otherwise may cause you pain or you have difficulty doing. So use long-handled equipment, like a long-handled reacher. So this is helpful to help you avoid doing movements like bending down to pick something up or perhaps overhead reaching to grab an item. As well, you can do a dressing aid, uh, like a long handle comb. Some of my patients with arthritis in their shoulder have difficulty rotating their shoulder backwards behind their head. And so this comb allows them to brush more easily. As well, you can try a sock aid. Um, so this avoids the bending motion towards the ground again. As well, it could be easier on your fingers when you uh, pinch the sock and grasp it towards your knee. You can consider using a button or zipper hook. Uh, so if you have difficulty pinching with your painful hands, this could be a solution for you. There are raised toilet seats, bath chairs, and furniture risers. These all help you achieve an ideal uh, seat height so that getting on and off your sitting surface is easier. Remember I talked about having at least 90 degrees at your hips and knees? As well, using bed rails or maybe chairs with armrests so that when you're sitting and getting off the bed or chair, you have your arms to push off of, allowing your upper body to work with your legs when you're getting from a sitting to standing position. You can use modified jar or can openers, which could be helpful for arthritic cans that have difficulty with grasping things tightly. Um, they come in many different styles, so you can choose the one that gives your hand an easier position to maneuver. Uh, as well, there are electric devices, like an electric one-touch can opener that can be helpful. You can also use built-up equipment, like a key handle, to help you with pinching your key and rotating your wrist to open the um, key with the door. Or there are built-up foam tubes that you can cut to any size so that you can fit on uh, almost any utensil. So looking at that last picture, you can put them on forks, razor blades, um, uh, maybe even a pen. Another door protection technique is wearing a splint or brace. So there are two types of splints that I would recommend if you have arthritis. One is a working splint uh, on that first picture towards your right. Um, and that doesn't impede your joint from movement. Rather, it allows you to use your hand throughout the day. What it does is it stabilizes your joint. And secondly is a resting splint. So the last picture um, at the bottom. Um, and this prevents deformity or any misalignment that your joint may have. And so you can use this during rest or overnight. Of course, joint protection strategies involves exercising, so to maintain your muscle strength and range of motion. Jean did an excellent job explaining the benefits of exercise and provided many examples. Uh, I want you to be aware that there are also hand exercises that uh, you can do to prevent stiffness. 
keep your hands mobile uh, by doing different hand motions or going through wrist movements. If you have some swelling or inflammation in your joints, you want to control it so it allows for better movement. You can try using hot or cold modalities. Cold is applied for inflammation and hot is used to relax stiff muscles. Sometimes you can consider doing a hot and cold contrast therapy, which is uh, done by alternating between the two temperatures. Refer to your therapist or physician prior to doing so because there are some precautions to be aware of. As well, you can try compression therapy. You can use compression gloves or compression socks to reduce the swelling. Moving on to the second concept of energy conservation, and I'm not talking about ways for you to save on your electricity bill, but rather ways to save your energy. Why use these techniques? It is meant to combat fatigue and potentially prevent uh, future flare-ups. When should you begin using these strategies? If you tire easily or more often, and you're starting to feel that you get exhausted, which prevents you from doing activities. Also, if you have the tendency to overdo. So this allows you to use these strategies and to put parameters or set yourself limits. So what does it entail? One idea is incorporating rest breaks during your activities and between activities. Imagine yourself as a car. In the morning, you have a full fuel of tank. So what you want to do throughout the day is take rest breaks or refuel throughout the day so that you don't end up ending, running on an empty tank or being in a state of exhaustion. Because being tired is the, uh, more likely for you to have accidents or to have falls. Another idea is planning ahead. Look at your daily or weekly schedule. You want to prioritize your tasks. Know when you are most alert during the days. If you happen to be a morning person, you should plan all the taxing or, or tasks that require more attention in the morning. As well, you want to alternate between light and heavy tasks. Or you can consider spreading out your heavier tasks throughout the week on multiple days. Organize your workspace so that commonly used items are easily accessible. So you can put things at counter height uh, or waist level. Um, as well, you want to make sure your sitting surfaces are at an appropriate height for you so that transitioning from that sit to stand is a lot easier than um, using uh, the strain of your legs. Lastly, you want to delegate strenuous work to others. So this is a time where you get to be a big boss and enlist the help of others to help you do the things that may cause you pain or have difficulty doing. So to conclude and to put things all together, I made up a fictional, but I think a relatable case, uh, case scenario of Vera. Vera has osteoarthritis in her hands and knees. Her pain is usually worse the day after she does a lot of cooking or works in the garden. She has pain and stiffness when she holds things tightly, overuses her fingers, kneels, and having her knee bent for a long period of time. What can she do? So with joint protection, she can consider avoid using a tight grip. She can per perhaps use built-up padding on her utensils or gardening tools. She can definitely carry heavy items using, for her, using her forearms instead of her hands. Uh, and of course, using proper body mechanics. She can use two hands to work. So giving her dominant and maybe arthritic hand a rest by making sure that she's uh, distributing the work to her other hand. She should use long little reachers to pick up items from the ground so she avoids her painful positions like kneeling or bending. She should ensure that the chairs are at a higher height so that her knee has a better angle so it's not always bent. She may want to consider using a hand brace Definitely, she should do daily exercises to ward away the stiffness. Uh, and depending on whether she has pain or inflammation, she could use hot or cold packs. And lastly, with energy conservation, some things that she can consider is taking, taking uh, frequent breaks from her painful positions. She should prioritize her task. So maybe limiting herself to one major task a day if that's what her endurance level limits her to. She should rearrange her kitchen and garden so that her work is done at all appropriate levels, 
uh, or appropriate heights, and that her tools and cooking supplies are all at a uh, accessible base level. Thank you, and that concludes my presentation. So I'll ask the speakers to come up now. We have a number of questions. If you have more questions, please hold your hand up with a little index card so that we can collect them. And I'll be asking our panelists uh, uh, the questions that you may have. Um, so let me see. I think it's Shirley, David, Jean, and then Tiffany, if that's OK. So uh, Shirley, let me uh, start off with you, if that's OK. And uh, just grab the mic when you're, when you're answering, if that's okay. Uh, so in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, would intervention at the early stages of arthritis uh, reduce the advancing of the disease, re reduce the progression of the disease? Okay, thanks for that question. So um, if I heard you correctly, what is the, the, the best treatment to prevent the progression of rheumatoid arthritis? And that would be um, being on these disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs that uh, I mentioned previously. So the sooner you, you see a rheumatologist, you can get on these medications. Those have been proven to, to basically turn off the inflammation in the autoimmune disease and prevent long-term damage and uh, pain. Great, thank okay. you. Thank you. David, uh, what about uh, Cymbalta for chronic pain? Is it safe and does it work? Yeah, so Cymbalta belongs to a brand name, lots of class of drugs called uh, SSRI antidepressants, and in some, in some people, uh, it can help with chronic pain. Uh, in fact, some guidelines recommend it as an as a early intervention, especially for patients with, uh, with chronic back pain. Um, is it safe? So you will get very different answers to that depending on who you ask. Uh, like all drugs, the SSRIs have side effects, um, and some of them are minor annoyances, including, by the way, the development of dependents, people who take these drugs regularly when they stop them, they get unusual symptoms. They can feel flu-like, they can get weird zap-like sensations in their, their, uh, their head. Um, there are rare reports of really bad things happening to people in the early days of antidepressant therapy, um, self-harm in particular. And so you may have heard about this um, talk, especially about 10 or so years ago, but the the, uh, the notion that in some people, a subset of people starting with antidepressants, that they can be a risk factor for suicide is an extremely difficult thing to study well. But having looked at the evidence on that, I think um, it's rare, but I think it's a real thing. I mean, you see somebody who, for example, is put on an antidepressant for something that isn't depression, and then becomes intensely suicidal and it goes away and they stop the drug. It's hard to argue with that. Um, there are a variety of other miscellaneous side effects. Um, I have used uh, drugs like Cymbalta for patients with pain, um, like every other drug I talk to you about, with variable results. Um, I, I have a low threshold to use it because I think that on balance, its safety profile is more favorable than, say, the anti-inflammatories or certainly the opioids. Thank you. Gene, how do you decide whether to use ice or hot packs for joint pain? Well, um, usually what happens is if the joint is very inflamed, very hot, um, for example, if you feel that, you know, um, if you want the pain of control because it's so inflamed, quite often we tell people to put ice on it just to calm it down. Um, if the joint itself really is not so inflamed, so hot, and it's more of a stiffness you're dealing with, then we would advise to use heat to help with the stiffness. Thank you. Uh, Tiffany, how do you get some of those uh, wonderful devices that you showed? Uh, can you get them at St. John's or how would you get them? So most of them you can purchase at any medical equipment store and there are um, chain medical equipment stores that are widely known like Shoppers Home Healthcare or there are mom and pop places that are just in your local neighborhood. Um, so I find that usually the salespeople are very uh, knowledgeable so if you were to go to them with the dimensions of um, perhaps like your off ledge, uh, they can help you find something that fits your home. Great, thank you. Uh, Shirley, we're just going to alternate if that's okay. Uh, why do some people get arthritis and never feel pain? Mm -hmm. That's a 
Very good question. I don't know if I have that answer. Uh, it's definitely true. Some people can have really severe, uh, what I like to call, knobby knuckles and arthritis in their hands and don't feel any pain. For us. Other people do. And, um, I'm not sure exactly why some do. I mean, I think um, definitely, I think it's not just about, you know, we talked a little bit about arthritis, it's not just about the joint. Um, it's definitely also involves uh, other parts of, uh, of the joint. So there's like soft tissue and, and, and the stability of the joint. Um, so if you have good protecting muscles and tendons and um, there's no other noxious stimuli to the nerves, um, some people don't feel pain because they're um, and I guess my, my best example of that is if you were to x-ray marathon runners, um, they have um, arthritis too, but they can still run 40 kilometers because their muscles are so strong. Um, so they still have arthritis, as in like some of the cartilage loss, but they don't feel that pain because their muscles are so strong um, and their tendons are uh, protecting their joint. Uh, and I, I'll just comment uh, related to that. There's also a question about neck osteoarthritis. And neck... Uh, degenerative changes are very common. If you take a bunch of, if you take a hundred asymptomatic people, people who have no symptoms at all, they feel perfectly fine, and run them through the CT scan or through an MRI scan, you'll see a high percentage of people have degenerative changes. It goes up with age. It's probably 30% for young folks, like on the panel here. It probably gets up to 40, 50% for older people like myself. Uh, but uh, you can have a lot of degenerative changes in your neck and have no symptoms at all. So it's hard to go by those x-rays, MRIs, or CT scans. And it often doesn't, it's just a normal effect of aging. It doesn't really mean that you're gonna have a disability. David, let me, uh, another class of drugs. What do you think about Lyrica? And do you think it relates to or contributes to memory loss or cognitive changes? Well, that's a good question. So, um, uh, so, I, I try to avoid the brand names. I want to say that Lyrica is pregabalin. Yes. Yeah, so pregabalin and, and its cousin gabapentin are drugs that we use quite a lot uh, in patients with pain, especially pain that's neuropathic pain that uh, uh, you might see in patients with diabetes, uh, with really kind of mixed results, I have to say. Um, the data, especially in gabapentin, aren't very good. But the way these drugs work is different than the other drugs I spoke about, and they too have a variety of side effects involving the brain and central nervous system, including withdrawal symptoms, dependence on withdrawal. Um, I, I must admit, I don't know offhand whether or not pregabalin interferes with memory. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised, given that it does things to neurons on a sort of a broad scale. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. One of the things I've gotten very good at is admitting when I don't know something. <laughs> more and more every uh, passing year. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jean, what about yoga for the yes. treatment of arthritis and pain management? Yes, actually. There's, you know, there is actually out there, there's a lot of different things that people can do. They talk about Tai Chi, they talk about yoga, and they talk about uh, Pilates. All those are, are possibilities. They're good. Yoga is, a, is a, a good exercise in terms of stretching. It's also a meditation. There's a, a lot of benefit to doing yoga, but you have to, everybody's condition is different. You really have to know how severe your joints are, how limited your joint movements are. And um, yoga may be very good for this person with arthritis, it may not be good for the other person with arthritis. It really depends on um, how inflamed your, your joints are, how limited your movement are. So in general, you know, there's advantage to yoga, but again, it's very individual depending on um, the condition of the patient, how severe they are. So that's why, you know, when I did my talk, it's always best to seek a, a professional opinion first, your medical doctor, a physiotherapist, or a, a rheumatologist to discuss your condition and whether your gut will be good for you because it can be good for people and may not be good for others. And Junior, I think you also made a really good point about maintain, maintaining the exercise. Mm -hmm. And so if you're doing something, if you think yoga is really boring, it's probably not a good one to choose because it's right. not going to last very it's long. Continue. So right. it's something that you find interesting, whether, and some people it's swimming, some people it's yoga, it's different for each person. Thank you. Uh, Tiffany, I don't know if this is you or Jean, but what is contrast therapy? Um, so I briefly introduced contrast therapy as a way to uh, control your edema or inflammation. Um, so the principle behind that is you're alternating between the two temperatures of hot and cold. And so when you think of applying anything cold, it's going to constrict your blood vessels. 
and putting something hot is going to open your blood vessels. And so by alternating the temperatures, it acts as a pump. It encourages circulation in your veins. Um, and so the most popular thing is a contrast bath, where you fill um, basins uh, full of water or a sink of water, and you'll be submerging um, your limb, for example, or right a can into these two temperatures. Um, just have some precautions to know that uh, with the changes of temperature, it can cause some dizziness. Uh, as well, if you have any loss of sensation, that you shouldn't do it. Um, if you have any questions regarding safety concerns, you should ask your therapist or physician uh, prior to starting. Thank you. Uh, here's one that I will try to answer, and, and, and if you can um, comment on this. Is spinal stenosis the prelude to arthritis or the other way around? So spinal stenosis, I usually think of as the degenerative process in the lumbar spine. It could be cervical spine as well. And it's usually, there is a, sometimes a hereditary predisposition to it, but a lot of it's the wear and tear on your back, eventually causing uh, arthritic changes, and that takes up space in the spinal canal. Doesn't mean you're going to get arthritis in other joints. You can have spinal stenosis and not have arthritis in other joints, and vice versa. You can have osteoarthritis and not get spinal stenosis. The, I don't see the two as being particularly linked. I don't know, Shirley, if you Yeah, agree no, with that. I agree with everything you say. Yeah, it's, uh, you can get spinal stenosis when you have severe arthritis in the back, but not, it's not necessarily linked uh, A number of questions, Shirley, on uh, how do I know what kind of arthritis I have? If I have arthritis in the hands or feet, mm -hmm. how do I tell if it's osteo, if it's uh, rheumatoid arthritis, if it's gout, how do I differentiate those? Um, so I think um, I would say the best way is to see your family physician and to maybe go through some of the, the questions that we went through before. Um, so if, if they need to do any more x-rays or blood work to help figure that out. Um, you know, I think also uh, on the Arthritis Society website, they have something called a symptom checker too. If, you, if anyone's interested in doing that, you can kind of go through some of the questions that you would have about things that can kind of help guide you. Um, as I say, osteoarthritis is the most common type of arthritis, one in eight people have that, but there are hundreds of different types of arthritis. So if you have other symptoms, I would definitely, you know, um, talk to your health professional to, to help figure that out. Great, so often it's hard to tell by yourself. You need the x-ray, you need the, the blood test to really differentiate. And then I think sometimes we're still confused even after that. So I'm more confused than Dr. Lake is, but uh, we still don't, it's not always uh, immediately obvious. Some blood thinner questions, David. So what about if you're on, uh, I'll ask you two questions if that's okay. If you're on Coumadin. You charge by the question of this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you're on Coumadin, uh, can you, what do you use for pain then? That's tough. Okay, so all of the blood thinners uh, can interact with the anti-inflammatory drugs. It's not... Uh, surprising, if, you, if, you, if we put you on a blood thinner to prevent a stroke because you've got atrial fibrillation or because you've got a clot in your leg or your arm, um, you're more prone to bleed. And if we then put you on an anti-inflammatory drug that irritates the lining of your stomach, you know, it's, it's, it's an invitation to bleeding. It's especially it's bad with aspirin. I didn't talk about aspirin in great detail. It's a drug that 30 years ago would have been used quite a lot more than it is nowadays for pain relief, often at much higher doses. Uh, but, um, but aspirin, to a greater extent than all of the other anti-inflammatories, predisposes people to bleeding. So it's challenging. Um, you know, you can in patients who are on anticoagulants, I think uh, you have to think long and hard before you put them on an anti-inflammatory drug. Um, I do. I've had some patients on the combination uh, because it's a, it's, a, it's a process whereby you. You know, you're experimenting the patient, you find that they really do develop a meaningful improvement in their pain and their function. Uh, and you say, well, you know, in your case, your potential harms of the anti-inflammatories are greater than somebody else like you who isn't on a blood thinner. Um, but I think in general, we, we are a little less enthusiastic about the anti-inflammatories when people are on blood thinners and try to use something else. Um, it's, uh, it's just one of these things that tilts the assessment, the individual assessment of the risks versus benefits um, away from using one class of drugs. It doesn't mean you can't. And then the related question is rivaroxaban. Is that, does that interfere with acetaminophen also? No, no the, the interaction, so increasingly people are using less and less warfarin and more than newer anticoagulants. Um, the interaction between acetaminophen and, and is specific to warfarin. 
And the story goes like this. I'm on warfarin, I get my blood checked regularly, I'm exactly in the right range, and then I get sick and I take two or three grams of acetaminophen for a few days at a time, and then my blood's really, really thin. That doesn't happen with any of the newer agents. The newer agents are effectively immune to states. It has to do with the mechanism of the interaction. The new drugs do not have that problem. They all share, all of the anticoagulants who share the interactions with anti-inflammatories. Oh, I, I just want to also mention, so I have a lot of patients too who are taking blood thinners and then we can't use anti-inflammatories because of interactions that were already mentioned. So then sometimes we try other, um, other mechanisms too, so uh, using sometimes these topical anti-inflammatories, sometimes if a joint injection, depending on the joint, depending on the previous response, that might be helpful. And then definitely using all the other things that were mentioned, like through physio and occupational therapy to help uh, also help the joint. So, um, so there are, we always try to figure out the best combination. Gene, about uh, exercise, uh, what if someone has uh, arthritis in their knee? They love playing squash, for example. David is a squash player, I can see that. Yes. Um, uh, should they stop playing squash? I mean, they feel better, they love doing it. Should they stop doing it to uh, serve their knee? Okay. So we talked about loading the joint. In fact, um, there are exercises that, lo that loading, load the joint actually can be good if it's a moderate amount of loading. But if you're talking about something that's more high impact, um, it can actually irritate the joint, and depending on how bad the joint condition is. If there is uh, people who are already close to bone on bone, there's not a lot of cartilage to lift and stuff like that, we really don't want to do high impact sports, okay? And if it's a, you know, if the x-ray shows it's the beginning of arthritis, and uh, you know, you're not really feeling a lot of symptoms, then you know, if you're doing squash and it's not, if you feel that you're not going crazy with it. And some of the sports, I also, sometimes I tell people, if you're doing a single, for example, tennis, if you do single and you're doing double, it's actually very different. If you're single, doing single tennis, you're already running a lot, and it can be more high impact compared to somebody who's doing double, it's not moving as much. But to answer to your question, whether it is a good exercise or not, if it is something you're doing a lot of, um, High impact, I would be would recommend it. Okay, and it depends how aggressive of a player you are. So that high impact would be a concern. High low impact, impact is actually a concern if you have arthritis. Moderate loading is okay, it's actually yeah. good for it, but high impact is probably not advisable. And I think from my experience, going downstairs is a higher impact on your knees than going upstairs. Well, you know, if you're going slowly, it's okay. On the stairs is all right. But what I'm talking about high impact is, for example, doing uh, jumping and stuff like that, those are, are not good for it. This is why I want to talk about low impact sports. Uh, walking is considered low impact. Um, and, you know, swimming is considered low impact. Those are actually good for you. But uh, squash, I'm not sure to the top of where someone play you are. Okay. Uh, Tiffany, uh, walking on a treadmill versus regular walking, and the treadmill having handrails to help you balance, is there a difference in terms of the uh, uh, being helpful? Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, what if you use a walker versus using a treadmill with handrails? Um, I would say if you're moving, that's a good thing. So whether it's walking with a walker or walking on a treadmill with the hands, um, keep moving. So with the walker, that's going to really give you uh, the proper posture when you're walking. When you have this hand support, it gives you um, a guide to keep your chest and uh, posture erect so that way you're using the correct muscles when you're walking. Um, and with the treadmill, um, if you're holding on to the rails while walking, it's uh, it's okay. I would say that's a good idea um, if your balance is poor. Uh, but Gene would probably argue if you're working on your balance, um, that is uh, probably a cheap way. Um, uh, but otherwise, I think if you're moving and you're walking uh, with any gait aid, as long as you're safe and you've been educated on how to use it, uh, then that's fine. Thank you. Shirley, there's a lot of questions about food. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'll just read some of them. Are there any vitamins that help control arthritis? Are there any foods that should be off limits, like nightshade plants, sugars? Um, let me just start with that. Yeah. So, so that's a very good question. I think um, it's, hard to, it's hard to, I'm not a dietitian myself, but I know that for certain arthritis, there's definitely 
certain foods that you should or shouldn't eat. As I mentioned, gout is one of them. Um, for different, for other arthritis, like osteoarthritis, it's not as clear cut. Um, there's kind of mixed evidence for certain foods related to it. So I, I don't, you know, there's been some literature about um, fish oils. Um, I think what was it that was mentioned, um, nightshades and, yeah, and nightshades. you know things like that. But I don't think you know it's ever been proven either or that it would make arthritis better or worse. However, ever doing that study would be very difficult to to ever do. Um, so I think it's kind of regarded. Uh, and I saw you had a picture of a high heel shoe with an X through it. You right. don't like high heel shoes, huh? Well, not not if you have knee and hip arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> why why are high heel shoes bad? Uh, they just think, well, I, I think uh, I'm not sure if because your occupational therapist can talk more about it, but just that that matter of pressure that you put through some of your joints irritate. Great, yeah. thank you, David. What? Um, what about statins? Do you think statins help arthritis at all? Well, if you, so statins are widely prescribed drugs for cholesterol lowering. Um, and uh, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of divergent opinion on who should be on statins and who shouldn't. There's also quite a lot of literature suggesting that people who take statins have a variety of other benefits separate and apart from the lowering of the cholesterol of the reduced risk of a heart attack or stroke, everything from reduced risk of infections to reduced risk of, of malignancies. We've done some of that research ourselves. Uh, what we don't know is whether or not that is because of the statin or because people who take statins are systematically different than people who don't. People who follow the doctor's advice and engage in healthy behaviors often just end up having better outcomes as a result of that. So um, I, I, I can't say offhand whether or not these drugs have a beneficial effect in arthritis. Maybe I'd look to our rheumatology colleague to ask uh, her, but I, I, I can say that people who uh, take statins tend to do uh, well on a variety of fronts with a variety of outcomes that you really wouldn't expect. Um, and it, it, it might be an effect of the statins, and it may just be that these are different people who have exhibit more healthy, healthier behaviors. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I don't know. Gene, regarding the GLAD program, the GLAD Canada program, uh, uh, the question is one benefit of the program is supposed to be a reduction in the number of joint replacement surgeries. Yes. Do you know if there are any Canadian statistics that support this outcome? See, the GLAD program was a program that was done in Denmark, and they've had apparently a lot of uh, positive results with the exercise that they give, uh, a lot of uh, sort of loading type of exercise. Uh, but um, Right now, now they're starting to become more popular, and the GLAD program now is very active in Canada, and uh, there's a lot of people are being trained to, um, uh, to be, become trainers uh, for patients who have arthritis. In fact, uh, there's a course coming up in uh, January, which I'm taking, and it's offered by GLAD Canada, supported by Born Joint Canada, and that, um, and that is going to be um, teaching uh, physiotherapists or um, um, uh, training professionals to do exercise in terms, in terms of in order to help people with arthritis. But it is supposed to be a very uh, positive program. They had a lot of positive effects in Denmark, and now it's becoming much more uh, popular now. And we're going to be doing a lot more of that in Canada. So it sounds like it's maybe too early to have statistical outcomes yeah, in Canada. Yeah, there's statistics in Canada yet, yeah. but um, not that I know of anyway at this point. Okay. Tiffany, how would people get into the St. John's treatment program for arthritis? Um, so we have the arthritic pool that Jean has mentioned, and uh, we do have referral forms that can be found online. Uh, so have your physician complete that, uh, so that way we know that you're medically stable to attend your program. Um, as well, we have a, not a specifically arthritic program, um, a fall prevention program that I'm also a part of. Um, and so that includes a home assessment with a pharmacist as well as an occupational therapist. Uh, they go in and they assess your meds for potential fall risks, or they even look over your pain meds too. Um, and then the OT does a home safety assessment. Uh, and then lastly, includes exercises, which could be similar to the exercises that um, are learned 
uh, to manage your arthritis, um, but it does increase your balance and it strengthens your legs. And similarly, um, that referral form is also found online, or if you give us a call, we will have a call mailing out to you as well. Okay. And it is, I know there's a small cost for the uh, pool treatment program. Yeah, actually, it's, um, I believe it's $100 for eight sessions, and it's done in a group setting, and there is a, um, a physiotherapy assistant who's trained in pool therapy, and um, he drives the exercise program in the class. Great. Can too, Shirley, can too many cortisone injections hurt your joints? Um, that's a good question. Um, so recently there was a study just uh, last year that showed that if you have too many, there, there was um, a higher association with more arthritis in the, in the knee, and that was done specifically in the knee. Um, so, and, and, and there have been other studies looking at um, different other animals who have had joint injections, and it does seem to in potentially increase the risk of arthritis and uh, uh, ligament uh, damage too. So we try not to do more than two a year um, if needed, and then if you're having more than that, or it's not as effective anymore, that's why we need to talk to the surgeons and say maybe that might be the better way. That was another question: is when do, when is the time for a surgical referral to consider surgery? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Um, the, what I usually say, the rule of thumb is, if you've already uh, exhausted all the non-conservative or the non-surgical uh, treatment options, so the physio, the occupational therapy, and some of the medical therapy, and that's not effective, um, that's a time to talk to a surgeon. If you're, if it's like a knee or hip, and you're starting to fall or have other health risks because of your arthritis, that's the time to talk to a surgeon. Or if, even if you're having um, really severe pain, so if it's waking up at night, that might be a time to, to talk to the surgeon. Right. Thank you. David, do you think Tylenol arthritis formula is any more effective than extra strength Tylenol? It's just a little bit more acetaminophen. Uh, so uh, in as much as it's more of the same drug, I suppose it could be. Uh, but with that comes the potential harms, specifically the liver. So um, I, I always... I'm always skeptical when I see these new formulations. To me, it's generally the company just trying to get another product on the market and, and, uh, and help sell more of the same. And I noticed you mentioned paracetamol on your slides. Oh, yes. And it sounds like that's more commonly used in Europe than it is here. Yeah. yeah. Do you have yeah. an idea why? Why what? Uh, why why is it more used? Yeah. Oh, I think it, so. Paracetamol is just the the, um, the 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 name that other countries give is acetaminophen. So we call it acetaminophen in North America, but if you go to the UK or Australia, they call it paracetamol or paracetamol, depending on their uh, inclinations. I think one of the reasons that uh, Europe, for example, uses more acetaminophen for pain is because they use uh, opioids less often than we do. Um, the, 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 it's not that um, other countries don't use opioids for chronic pain, they do. And uh, certainly in Australia and uh, in some parts of Europe, they've begun to use opioids more and more. Uh, but it, the, 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 the prescribing element of the opioid crisis I alluded to is really a, it's really a North American phenomenon. And if you talk to a doctor in England, for example, he or she is just uh, blown away by the sorts of doses that we use here. And so I think it's, 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 I suspect it's a reflection of them um, trying to help patients more than harming them by using drugs that at standard doses generally don't cause a whole lot of harm. This next question is perhaps both for Jean and for Shirley. Uh, as someone who takes methotrexate and does exercises to strengthen the muscles around the knee and has gotten some relief and no longer gets pain going up and down stairs and uh, isn't sure uh, whether it's the methotrexate or the exercise that's helping, and what's going to happen if the person stops taking the methotrexate? Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to tell? Yeah, you want to go first? Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, so I, I'm assuming that this person has rheumatoid arthritis, and, um, and so, so the current thinking around rheumatoid arthritis is there is no cure for the, for the disease, so usually... Um, unfortunately, when there's no cure, you need to use medications to help control it or maintain. So, um, a lot of my patients uh, will ask, when is the time that we can stop the methotrexate? And unfortunately, for most patients, they need to stay on some sort of disease modifying um, anti rheumatic drug, uh, whether it's methotrexate or something else. We always try to use as, as low a dose as possible, but um, uh, 
but you know, most of the time we can't stop it completely. So um, definitely it's, it's really important to keep doing the exercises, um, but I also think it's probably best in general to stay on the medication. If I'm understanding the question correctly, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think I think um, um, in the recent study, more recent uh, evidence-based study has shown that actually actually doing exercise uh, sometimes can help reduce your medication. I mean, yeah, you, like you said, you probably have to stay on the on the medication for the rest, you know, what, because of the disease itself. But from the latest research, has shown that with the exercise, you may be able to reduce the the, the amount of medication you, you take. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Tiffany. I don't know if you're, if any of us are able to answer this question, but uh, we can talk about it. Well, given that the population is getting older and arthritis is getting fairly common, uh, and and exercise gives a positive outcome, why aren't there more warm water pools in the Greater Toronto area? Ask your city. Yeah. <laughs> It's probably a Ministry of Health question and a city are, question. There, I think there, there are quite a few facilities. You just have to look, um, I guess, sometimes online. There are some facilities. Um, I know that St. John has one. I think Baycrest has one, too. Yeah. And there are some community pools that have higher temperature water as well. So you just have to look in. The one, yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some facilities have it. You just have to look into it online. Checking the temperature and see if it's because the warm water does help with the uh, the level of pain when you exercise. Right. That's a hard question to ask. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. How warm should the water be? At, uh, at uh, St. John's is about ninety-two. I think ninety-two or ninety-three degrees Fahrenheit. It's quite comfortable. So, uh, Shirley and David, this might be bo both of you, but um, uh, there's a lot of, like when I go to Costco, you can buy these big jars of glucosamine and big bottles of, you know, chondroitin. And um, if, if you had a relative with arthritis, would you recommend that they take that? Oh, um, it's really cheap at Costco. Yeah, so <laughs> it's a good buy. I am skeptical about its utility. The reason why I don't fault anyone for trying it, and I'm happy to have someone encourage you, is because it's harmless and pretty much zero. So if someone says, I have taken chondroitin or glucosamine, and I feel better about healing, I'm not going to come at them with something that's more dangerous. It's, uh, I, 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 I'm skeptical about how well it works, um, but uh, I'll defer to so, so the evidence shows that uh, glucosamine chondroitin is, is no better than placebo um, in the trials, so that's like a sugar pill. That being said, there was still a you know a thirty to forty percent improvement even with placebo. So that's what I say to you. Know, if, I would say try it if you want to. The biggest harm is to your wallet for three months. If you do find you're better after you're taking it, then continue it. Um, but if it's if you're no better, then then I would probably stop it. And a lot of if you look at the bottles of these, a lot of these natural packaged products, they have. Um, other things in it. So a lot of glucosamine also has natural capascasin, which is an anti-inflammatory in it too. So just be aware that sometimes it is what's actually making you feel better. Is it really the glucosamine or is it this um, uh, other anti-inflammatory in that formulation? And another question for the both of you. Uh, psoriatic arthritis. What is that and how do you treat that? Is that for the both of us, or for yeah. well, let me let me ask uh, Shirley first, oh, okay. and then may, maybe you could yeah, so, comment on the medical management. Yeah, yeah. So psoriatic arthritis is another type of autoimmune associated with it. So the treatment is usually around suppressing the immune system that gets confused. It's 